Hey friends, are you familiar with the most trusted business network for business executives? It's the C-Suite Network. If you're a business of $5 million or greater, and if you're a VP level or higher, then you're invited to join the C-Suite Network to connect with your business peers. Go to c-suitenetwork.com, that's a c-suitenetwork.com, to learn more about the benefits, meetings, and services exclusive for C-Suite executives like you. Okay, let's do the show. It's time to Accelerate. Hi, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 465 of Accelerate, where I hold in-depth conversations with today's leading experts in sales, marketing, and leadership six days a week. On the seventh day, we do our Espresso Roundup show. Make sure you check that out. So, you know, there are thousands of you that listen to Accelerate every day, and we really appreciate your loyalty and your support. And we'd love it even more if you subscribe to Accelerate. You can do that right on your phone, on the podcast app on your phone, and also if you left a quick review for Accelerate, again, you can do that from the podcast app on your phone or on your computer. So really appreciate the support. Thanks again. Now, one of the hardest things a sales leader can do is, is hire salespeople. And getting it right is so important because getting it wrong can be hugely distracting and costly in terms of lost time and opportunities. So to help you get it right, I've created a guide to hiring the right sales candidates for your company. It's called How to Hire a Winning Sales Team. Sales Leader's five-step guide to better sales hiring, and it's free, available for you. Just go to accelerate.fm forward slash winning to download your free guide today. Again, that's accelerate.fm forward slash winning to get your free copy of How to Hire a Winning Sales Team. Joining me on the show today is William Wickey. He's the Senior Manager of Content and Media Strategy at Lead Genius, and one of the authors of an ebook titled 2017 Trends and Tech Guide for B2B Sales and Marketing which is going to be the subject of our conversation today. William, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you for having me on, Andy. It's a pleasure to chat with you. Oh, my pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. So this ebook was a collaborative effort between multiple companies. That is correct. Uh, We co-wrote this book over here at Lead Genius with Ambition um, and also Prezi, Prezi Business. All right. So two Bay Area firms and one Tennessee firm. That's right. All right. So what was the impetus to get together and write it and publish it? So this is actually um, the second ebook I had written with Jeremy. Um, Jeremy, Jeremy from Ambition. Ambition, right? That's correct. Jeremy Boudinet. Uh, the first ebook we wrote last year was also a collaborative effort with Ambition and Persist IQ about marketing and sales alignment. Uh, folks can go back and find that at accountbasedebook.com. Uh, but it was how to use an account-based strategy in companies that use the SDR model. Mm -hmm. And it worked out, it worked out really well. You know, um, people were engaged with the content, you know, we do a lead share with this type of stuff. So it was mutually beneficial for all the companies involved and a trends and technology guide, um, is not anything new for lead James. We've done this in the past and ambition has as well. Um, and some incarnation or another Prezi has additionally, and we just got into conversations with them about, um, how we could, you know, combine our resources and put something together that isn't, uh, admittedly the most brand new concept in the world. People have read trends and technology guides before for sales and marketing, but we wanted to do it really, really well. Well, you have sort of a unique structure to the book and I've read it and it's well worth people downloading it and reading it, uh, because you're going to learn a bunch of new things about you know, companies that can help you in specific ways, but you sort of organized it by, I'll say problem area, and then described what that was. Then you, I'll say curated, let's say, a, a, broad, sort of a broad range of solutions for each of those problem areas. So how, how did you decide who got included, whose who's tech solution got, got included in the book? Sure, yeah, that's right. Um, and people can go check it out at b2btrendsintech.com. The, the structure of the ebooks, I'll start there and then um, discuss how we got into the technologies we picked. Um, there have been a lot of trends guides out there. Usually they're high level. They come out at the beginning of the year and it tells you what's happening. Um, here's a few things you should look out for. You know, if this was 2016, some of the stuff that was big on the radar, it's, it's account based marketing is brand new. And here's the possibility of predictive analytics. But typically those just pure trends guides don't get into uh, what's actually happening at the company level. Why? Are, are these big trends relevant and connected to actual business problems that marketing and sales organizations have? And then you also have technology guides where there's simply uh, a list of companies. Um, there's some really good comprehensive ones out there with a description, but it's, it's tough to parse out what 
uh, marketing and sales solutions do and do well because there's so many multifunctional uh, products out there where you know uh, even multiple departments will end up using something. So mm-hmm. the way we we organized this was started with a big picture uh, idea of six or seven trends that are happening in the marketplace today that both um, B2B sales and marketing leaders and really anyone in um, a B2B company should be aware of. Um, then map those to some of the needs that you might see on the organizational level. Um, some of the things that perhaps your, your boss is asking of you as a sales leader, the CEO is asking of, of you. Um, and then if you see those needs um, happening at your company, we give suggestions for some of the technologies you should go out there and check out. The methodology for putting this together is a little bit subjective, but what we wanted to do is highlight some of the people who might not yet be on your radar. Some of the more point solutions and some of the up and coming companies that maybe you haven't demoed. And really, if there's one thing that someone who reads this book can walk away from, um, other than just confirmation and high level idea of you know the trends they see in the market or things that other people are seeing as well, is kind of a uh, go-to list for folks that are platforms you should evaluate um, or, or be demoing. There's so much out there. This isn't intended to be the most comprehensive uh, technology guide. It's how you should prioritize um, some of the up-and-coming companies and where you should spend your time demoing, evaluating, and doing trials with, et cetera. So I think a, a valid question, yeah, as a result of reading the book, and not a criticism, but a, a observation is that it seems – more oriented towards perhaps tech companies than the broader B2B sales market? Well, that's definitely true. I mean, for both Prezi, Lead Genius, and Ambition, there's no doubt that we have traction within the tech vertical, especially being out here in the Bay Area. Um, But at Lead Genius, and for people who aren't familiar with what Lead Genius does, um, we're a platform for lead generation and go-to-market insights. We work with people in both the marketing and sales side of B2B companies and help them figure out how to scale up their strategy, particularly in an outbound context, get the contacts that they need to fuel outbound programs, and then give them analytics and insights on top of that to figure out um, the fastest way to get to market in specific verticals. So we work with people outside of tech as well. Tech's maybe about 20% of our customer base. And we see the same challenges um, in marketing and sales organizations in companies like construction and manufacturing and uh, things well outside that specific tech vertical. So if there is um, anything I would let the listeners know about this ebook is that it's not specific towards technology necessarily. Uh, okay. We see trends for both sales and marketing um, happening. Um, we see the same things happening in a lot of different industries, a lot of different verticals. Well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask. So one of the, you know, let's jump into some of the trends. So one of the trends was the segmented sales force, which, you know, to me is really about specialization, right? Is mm-hmm. that roles are becoming more specialized within sales organizations. Certainly we do see this uh, in the tech business, certainly driven by the SaaS model, uh, with your SDRs and your AEs and you know CSMs and so on, um, but you know less so sort of with companies outside. I mean, we're yes, we're seeing a trend toward inside sales, but in many companies, that's sort of the degree of specialization. You got inside sales, you got your outside guys. Um, so, what are you seeing in general? You know, with your non-tech companies, eighty percent of the the clients that that aren't in tech. What degree of specialization are you starting to see in those, those non-tech companies? So one thing that we're seeing in a lot of these, these sales orgs is the rise of the sales development rep function. Um, like you said, there's inside and outside folks. And, and for the inside sales orgs, people are bringing in this SDR type role that is used in an outbound context to get to market faster. And the reason that that, that role is rising a little bit in importance or in prevalence um, is because we are seeing a drive for both marketing and sales teams to align their efforts. And in many ways, um, this SDR function is that fulcrum that um, is the alignment point for both of those, both of those departments. What we actually see in a lot of uh, B2B companies is the marketing team driving the messaging 
and sometimes the actual activities of a sales development rep, and then some of the output and um, some of the KPIs being aligned more on the sales side. So rise of the SDR function specifically is one of those things driving driving this segmented sales force. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, and that certainly makes sense. I mean, part of the comment was based upon the fact that, you know, when you look sort of outside the, the tech bubble and maybe outside some, you know, larger enterprises that, you know, the world of sales is still, unfortunately, largely unchanged for the last 20 years or more. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I give this example uh, on the show before, but, you know, a client, Working with uh, eighty plus inside sales people, no tools at all, mm-hmm. right? No email tracking. No, I mean even the basics, right? That you'd think everybody would have these days. So, it, gosh, it seems like most of this world out there is uh, people just still untouched by all the incredible technological changes that are taking place within sales and marketing. That's definitely true. So that's one of the reasons we put this book together is for people who are in organizations like that, where things have been done for the same way for maybe a decade, two decades, they have those 80 inside sales reps and consistency is something that that company values and they want to, you know, hit quota, make the numbers and, you know, occasionally have um, growth goals in mind. They're, they're hearing about things that are happening in other areas. Sometimes, they're looking to you know the coast or the Bay Area to see what kind of technology is out there. And some of it's hype, some of it's not. So we wanted to give them a good starting place for actually evaluating some of those tools that they might want to incorporate into their organization. Because I think our contention would be that those orgs are not necessarily going to do, do things the same way forever or indefinitely. What they're sure. doing right now might be working, but they're probably going to incorporate different processes and technologies they're going to help them um, grow and become more efficient, et cetera. I would also say that we're seeing some um, of the companies that we work with in some of these industries you think of as fairly old and they do things in a, in a fairly static way, being driven to change and uh, to move from a consistency mindset to a growth mindset because of what's happening in the market. I'll give you an example in uh, manufacturing and construction. Mm -hmm. Those are not necessarily the most cutting edge industries out there when it comes to how marketing and sales operations are conducted. Um, But what's happened with just technology and the world getting smaller is that 10, 15, 20 years ago, marketing or sorry, manufacturing and construction companies basically had their book and they worked it and they worked it well. And that was the responsibility of account executives or or salespeople, enterprise salespeople at those organizations. And now because uh, just because of shipping and because people across the world can be your competitor now, um, those companies now have a different mindset. They want to know how to grow. They want to know how they can get to people who they formerly weren't necessarily considering uh, in their markets or geographies. So figuring out how to target new people Um, figuring out how to break into new areas geographically or or new industries is Mm -hmm. something on the mind of uh, a lot of sales leaders. A lot of sales leaders are being asked, um, given increased goals, they're being asked to squeeze more juice out of that same old orange without changing the economics of their business, which is a tough thing to do. How do you get more without more budget, more people, et cetera? need to get creative and in some cases uh, adopting technology to to help you get there. There's so much out there so it's a difficult thing to figure out where to start and evaluating some of this stuff. That's what we're hoping to do with uh, B2BTrendsandTech.com this 2017 ebook. Okay, so for this whole topic of sales specialization, you've got a number of solutions, so can you talk about a couple of the solutions that companies could look at? Um, Yeah, maybe somebody's as you said, starting to bring their build up an SDR function inside their company. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure. What are, what are they going to need? I mean, I know you don't want to go through the whole stack, but yeah, you know, sort of in this topic area that you have in the book. Sure. Some of the things that people should consider um, are, I would say the first two things when it's um, regarding the SDR function and growing that and adding scale to the sales process Outbound email solutions that allow for um, heavy personalization and um, 
easy tracking are is something that I would consider. This would include companies out there like um, Outreach.io, Yesware, Persist IQ, um, simple email tools that um, people usually fall on one side or the other of. They they've either over familiar with that type of area and they think, well, why can't I just do everything from Gmail? Why can't I do everything from my marketing? Uh, email and I and I come from the marketing side of things, so I have marketers say to me all the time, like, "Well, why can't I just do outbound email with, you know, with HubSpot or Marketo or a Mailchimp, etc." And then on the sales side, it's like, "Well, why can't I just send emails from from Gmail? Um, why can't all my reps just, you know, maintain their own communications there and log activity in Salesforce?" Um, the tools that we highlight uh, in this area are things that you can use to coordinate messaging at scale. And make sure that uh, insights from particular reps are not getting lost in the shuffle of data. You're actually mm-hmm. able to iterate on what's working, learn, and start from a consistent process. So what that looks like actually in practice is a single template used for your 15 or 50 reps. Um, work that eight email sequence set up, you know, timed or, or trigger-based email sequences that are intended to, you know, gauge a prospect's interest, get a positive reply, convert them into a qualified lead and do all that automatically. Just putting the positive replies or the replies in the hands of the rep, making their time more efficient rather than that tit for tat back and forth all day on email. That can be a a big time saver for those guys. The other thing that I would suggest for sales teams considering an approach like that is your data strategy. How are you acquiring and maintaining quality contact and account data. How are you getting data points that allow for uh, personalization at scale? One thing that you hear a lot about personalization, and I guess I should qualify that personalization in an outbound email function isn't just purely about merge fields in an email. It it is about that. You know, you can go look at it. Well, as the recipient of many of them, it seems like for 99% of the companies, that's exactly what they're doing. They're definitely doing that. You can go look up, you know, all sorts of different blog posts about personalization and your subject line, increasing open rates, et cetera. And and that's, that's true to a certain degree, but the real personalization element that quality data and having the right data allows you to do is segmenting those email sends in to targeted blasts that are, um, you know, a template that is actually has compelling messaging structured around a specific type of individual within your system. That's an example of, you know, the type of personalization you can get with some of the data providers out there today. Lead Geniuses does this to a certain degree. Um, Providing high quality data is definitely something that we do. Um, But depending on your process, there might be better solutions out there for you that are just pure data plays um, depends on whether scale is most important to you and unique data points offer insights into your mm-hmm. customers mm-hmm. specifically for some people it doesn't um, and making sure that you have a technology in place to actually get the most out of that so one, one of the points that you guys bring out in in your text and this this is sort of a data point that i always find very very interesting and i ask lots of people about it but is that uh, you quote some studies saying that uh, only 33% of inside sales rep time is spent actively selling. So mm-hmm. we have this this uh, <laughs> you know, move toward more and more inside sales, yet we have industries saying that that uh, you know, percent of reps hitting quota, and, you know, so general performance stats aren't real, real positive for the sales industry, at least in the B2B side. So so what's the secret in terms of some of the solutions you're talking about to be able to help the reps spend more of their time actively selling? I mean, you talked a little bit about with the email outbound, but, but is there even you know, studies you guys came across when you're writing the, the ebook saying that, yeah, here's sort of a realistic number in terms of percentage mm-hmm. of time? Because it's not going to be 100%. What, what, yeah, would be, what would be that number? It depends on, on, the, on, the, on the sales function, I would say. So you obviously want... Um, your personnel's time spent on some of the highest value activities that they possibly can. So this goes back to that idea of the segmented sales force and division of labor. Not every person on your team needs to be out there just selling, 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 or out there, um, you know, on closing calls or, or disco calls, et cetera. 
if that's not what their function is, um, at some of these roles where there is an SDR function in place, all they need to do is set up calls or they need to set up uh, demos or give quick demos. And you, what your goal is, is to get that person doing more of those things. So a, a full percentage of you know, that an individual's time selling, I think it would be tough to estimate. Um, but what I would encourage every sales leader to do is go and do an audit of your rep's time, do an audit of their prospecting process. How many steps are involved? Are they going to LinkedIn and then, you know, looking at the company, then going to LinkedIn Navigator and pulling down certain data, entering into Salesforce, um, then hopping on, you know, that person's Twitter account to see if they put anything out there recently so they can have a, a jumping off point for a conversation. And if that's what the process looks like, there are certainly technologies out there that can save that rep, you know, five minutes per call times 200 times a, a, a day. Mm -hmm. um, if that process of just looking at LinkedIn and getting the URL and that information is, is bogging them down. So, um, that would be an example of how you can get that, um, SDRs, whose job it is to go out there, prospect, and then give demos um, more time to focus on the higher value activity of giving demos by putting the quality information that they need in their hands right off the bat and making sure that it's accurate and they can trust it and um, they can just, you know, execute. Well, one of the conundrums of that we're seeing is, you know, we use the term, you know, personalization, personalization, personalization at scale. And as as we alluded to just you know, a few minutes ago, it oftentimes it's nothing more than you know a mail merge first name field. Mm -hmm. And so, what what is the the answer from your point of view for how we truly personalize without you know people investing a tremendous amount of time doing it? I mean, I know we people talk about yeah, spend three minutes, find three data points, you know, we da 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 that advice, which is great advice, but. You know that's going to add up over the course of a day. What's really the answer to this, or or do we just sort of say, look, you know, personalization is just sort of true personalization. It's just sort of a a nice to have, but you know, we're also winking at each other and saying, yeah, we're not really doing it. Yeah, I think that um, there's two ways in that outbound context you can do personalization. It is the mail merge, like you mentioned, and then it's also the actual targeting. So making sure that the message of your email or whatever the communication is most relevant to this person's needs. So um, when it comes to a mail merge, if you're just saying, hi, Andy, and then you go into your spiel, that's not really personalization. You know, maybe that's a, a nice to have there. And in that case, I would agree. It's just nice maybe to say, hey, you know, put a person's name in there. I was listening to one of your, one of your podcasts um, with a Robert Cialdini and, you know, he talks about, um, you know, trust and using people's names and influence the psychology, psychology of persuasion mm -hmm. and how people love that type of familiarity. Um, I would definitely encourage, by the way, all your listeners to go back and check out that interview. Cause that's a, that's no, a good one. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a value there, but that's not real personalization, I think. And, and that's what you're alluding to. Yeah. But that same function actually can be used for real personalization. And that function, um, when I say that, I mean a mail merge. For example, some of our customers are solar companies. And the way a solar company uh, might personalize an outbound email, a hardware provider, is that they want a list of all the people who are you know, in the Bay Area who own a home with X amount of roof space that is facing south. You need a south facing and no, and no roof trees. space. No trees. You need that that nice California sun, and you know you need someone to go out there and look on Google Earth to you right. know um, find that that space. So in addition to that, um, that's one way you can do the targeting. On top of that, there's differing utility rates for different areas um, depending on the city you're in, depending on the county. Um, and having that available for a mail merge is quite valuable when you're trying to persuade someone who is, um, might be potentially saving money with installing this solar technology in X amount of years. That is an actual personalized conversation that you're starting, even if it's, um, something that is templated out, you know, hi, Andy, I noticed that 
You own a commercial building in downtown Berkeley. It has 350 square feet of roof space. The utility rates in uh, Alameda County are, you know, five cents a watt. And in three months, you're going to be able to, um, you know, these are going to pay for themselves. So as a, a building manager, a building owner, that's something you'd be interested in. That's a personalized communication. So with the right data, you can actually use those, you know, the old tried and true function of a mail merge to get a very pre, a very personalized communication that someone might say, hey, I want to learn more about. Now, I agree. I think the great point. So my question B is, um, <laughs> and this is going to sound kind of trivial, but it, it's one I've, I like to ask marketers. So why do we feel compelled to start all of our up on emails with the salutation hi? <laughs> That's a because it's the same thing. It's like yeah, it's like there's a federal regulation, right? That you know, that uh, your yeah, outbound emails from salespeople have to begin with the word "hi," so you can identify them as such. But the fact is, you can identify them as such. And I think, and as I said, I don't want to sound too trivial about it. But yeah, you know, for me, when I see the "hi," it's like, okay, yeah, I don't need to read that one. Let's go to the next one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the answer is just. Uh maybe one part laziness, one part shiny toy, like this function is here. So let's do it. And there's, you know, I've seen it in my inbox a million times. So that's how I think an email should be written. Um, but I think that's the mentality. So, um, you bring up a good point. There's just a lot of homogeny when it comes to outbound emails, you know, you get them all day, I get them all day. They, they look very similar. Oftentimes it's that same format. And you'll see these, you know, if you're, receiving outbound emails consistently, just the trends and how people sort of format these. It'll be the hi, hi, Andy, one sentence about my company, three bullet points, our value prop. <laughs> Let's do you have five minutes to hop on a call. And there'll be, you know, 20 of those in the inbox every morning when I, when I come to work. So that is, yeah, I think just being lazy and there's more creative ways that people can use, um, data to actually add value into those. There's more creative ways that people can write these emails and make them interesting, you know, just some good old fashioned selling. Um, and there's other, or, there's other ways too, with, you know, people using personalized video and stuff and that, and, you know, those are things I think worth keeping an eye on, but yeah, every salesperson out there can do, uh, I think and challenge themselves to write a more compelling email. Yeah. Oh, and you mentioned video. I mean, I, I, I love the video emails like bomb bomb. You know, we're talking about particular services. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever used it, but if you want a hundred percent open rate, that's, that's a great tool to use. Yeah. Vidcaster is another one out there. Um, which one was that? Vidcaster. Vidcaster. Uh, okay. vid, Vidyard. Um, I'm, I've checked out a, a handful of these recently and we use an SDR team over here at lead genius and, the coordination of our outbound efforts happens on the marketing side, even though the function um, lives in sales. Um, and yeah, we've been exploring some of that personalized video, and the results have been been pretty positive before. Uh, pretty, pretty positive so far. Um, and we've been testing open rates, uh, reply rates, positive reply rates. So those are definitely companies worth checking out. Features worth checking out. Yeah, very definitely. Um... Gosh, I had a question that just sort of slipped my mind. <laughs> and, huh, got too many interviews today. Um, I know how it goes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you made a, a good point about the earlier about the mail merge with adding specific, oh, I know what it was, specific things is, is the, um, yeah, just in emails, try to focus something that has something of value. You know, you're talking about your solar example. It was sort of a simple financial calculation. It wasn't accurate, but it was, as you said, it was tuned based on the utilities that you rate and the area they're in and so on. And the, yeah, the house layout, do they have a you know, semi-flat roof with the exposure to the south? Is that catches the eye. Mm-hmm. To spend a little time thinking, and this is sort of just sort of my general thought in, in sales in general, is with too much on automatic, automatic pilot and you know we have to think every time we're reaching out to somebody because we're creating these perceptions and the impressions whether we're aware of it or not absolutely i mean just demonstrating relevance is a uh big step in the right direction it's always surprising to me um some of the 
yeah, just sort of zombie autopilot, um, approach that, um, some of the sales emails I get regularly have to them. And it's, um, there's so much noise out there that you really have to, um, make that message compelling in order to stand out. You you're very easily blend in with everyone else. If just for that split second, you, you look like just a, another person in the pack with, um, something to sell that doesn't look like it's relevant to you. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, we could spend a whole nother episode just talking about, about that particular topic. I mean, I have to literally restrain myself every morning to, from replying to some of them because they're just so egregiously bad. Yeah, there, there are some. And this didn't send what demonstrates this. And this is, you know, organizations that we all know the names of. It's like, oh, come on, come on, do better. I mean, you're making us all look horrible. I mean, we're all in the sales business and, and yeah, we, you know, we have lots of people write books trying to talk about how do we, how do we overturn the ter- stereotypical perception of salespeople? And, mm-hmm. you know, we've migrated from, you know, the used car salesperson being the one that everybody talked about to now, unfortunately it's starting to be, you know, our, our inside sales reps. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely the case. And you've got, um, in, in many uh, circumstances, especially for that SDR role, just a you know pure volume play um, in the works. Many times, it's just a recent college grad who's out there, just basically you know in the boiler room. The new boiler room is is, is the sound of the you know keys typing instead of the the phone ringing um, or people dialing out, and they're just they're just trying to get stuff out the door. And many times like it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's uninspired and it doesn't get a great response and they're just looking for margins, you know? Um, well, but the issue is, and you talked about it right there, it's, it's this continued emphasis on quantity over quality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't think that in the long term that's, that's sustainable. Um, oh, absolutely not. Yeah. Yep. So, okay. Well, William, unfortunately we've run out of time, but uh, I want to thank you for being on the show and tell folks how they can find out more about you and lead genius and connect with you. For sure. Yeah. I very much appreciate the time and have enjoyed talking with you, Andy. People Likewise. can find me um, at, on Twitter, W wiki, W I C K E Y lead genius. Is it lead genius.com? Um, the ebook that we're talking about is it B2B trends and tech.com. And early in the show, I mentioned our, our book about, um, account-based marketing and sales alignment, specifically with the uh, SDR function in mind. You can find that at accountbasedebook.com. Um, so again, I appreciate the time, Andy. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, well, thanks again, William, for joining us. So, And friends, thank you for spending this time with me today. Please come back and join me again tomorrow or next time if this is Saturday. So uh, until then, if you have a chance, go to iTunes, subscribe to Accelerate, leave us a review. We really want to hear back from you what we can do better to be a better service to you. And uh, thanks again for joining me. Until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone.